Well, good morning. I invite you to stand and turn to hymn 104. Hymn 104, Amazing Grace. your attention to the baptistry. Good morning. I tell you, it's great that uh, I've had the opportunity uh, here to baptize so many so often. Uh, it's been great to just see people responding to the Lord and to following him in believers' baptism. And this morning we have the privilege to baptize Dustin Davis. Uh, Dustin, if you'll come down here. Dustin and his family, they joined the church a couple weeks ago, and uh, Dustin, he had uh, made his profession of faith a few years ago at a camp and trusted in Jesus Christ to be his Lord and Savior, but uh, he had never been baptized, and so this morning he comes to take that step of obedience in uh, believer's baptism and uh, to just make it public to you all that he's a Christian and that his plans are to follow Christ all the days of his life. And Dustin... Um, have you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ to be your personal Lord and Savior? All right, then Dustin, uh, upon your profession of faith, uh, it is my joy to baptize you, my brother, Dustin Davis, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, buried with Christ through baptism unto death, raised to walk in newness of life. Amen. And all God's people said, Let's worship together. Well, I want to welcome you to First Baptist Church. If you are a visitor or if you haven't been here in a while, there should be a visitor card right there, a welcome card in the pew rack in front of you. Just fill it out. Uh, fill out your information. Uh, so if you want to contact, uh, want us to contact you, just put all the information in there and drop it in the offering plate, and uh, we'll, be, we'll make sure we get that. I want to point your attention... To, um, to a few announcements this morning. Uh, we are taking up our state missions offering, the Eliza Broadus offering, this morning. Um, so we ask you to, um, to pray and to give as the Lord, um, as the Lord leads on that. Um, just a couple more announcements. Kids Shine will meet tonight at 6.30. Um, youth Committee will meet next Sunday at 7.30. And if you um, have your college student's address, uh, the... Baptist young women are looking to send care packages to them soon. So if you have your address, uh, the address for your college students, drop it in the offering plate or send it to the email, um, the church office email. It's right there in the bulletin. Well, we'll be glad to have that and give that to the Baptist young women. Um, also, if you look in your, uh, the church announcements section of your bulletin, there's an address there for Nash Crowley. He is at boot camp, and we want to encourage you. If you, will, if you want to send an encouraging letter or a note to Nash, to do that. I'm sure he's going to appreciate it and his family will appreciate it. So the address is right there for you to take advantage of that. As we move to our prayer request section this morning, I want to make note that Jackie Coleman is having breast cancer surgery tomorrow. 
Um, so be in prayer for her and her family. Also, Mark McMillan, as many of you know, had to have his gallbladder removed, but he now has an infection in his bloodstream. Um, he's at, still at Cardinal Hill, but he, he may be moved to a hospital real soon. So please be in prayer for Mark McMillan, Debbie, and Grant um, as the doctors try to figure out what's going on and, and how, to, how to help and heal Mark. Also, um, if you notice, Brother Brad is not here this morning. He and his family traveled to Arkansas to, uh, to celebrate and to surprise his mother for her 80th birthday. Um, so they will be traveling back today, so keep him and his family in your, in, in, in your prayers for safe travels. All right, do we have any other prayer requests this morning? All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we come, to, come before you today and thank you for being able to gather together in your house, Lord. Father, we lift up all those who are sick and, and who are ailing, Lord. We especially want to lift up um, Mark this morning. We, we ask that you be with his doctors so they can help pinpoint exactly what's going on, Father. We ask that you be with Debbie and Grant and just comfort them and, and let them know that you are there to protect Mark and, and, and you will help heal him, Lord. Father, we bring before you Jackie as she goes in for the surgery tomorrow. Father, we ask that you put a hedge of protection over, over her and, and be with her during her surgery, Father. Lord, we, we come before you today with praise and adoration, and we love you, Lord. And we ask that you be with us as we, as we sing these songs to, your, to you, Father, to lift up your name. We ask that you be with us as we hear your message that Brother Kyle will preach. We ask that you be with us as we leave here and as we return tonight for our activities and, and church tonight, Father. We love you, Lord. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. All right, I'm going to invite you to stand once more. Turn to hymn 149. Hymn 149. Praise him. Praise him.
Let us pray. Father, once again, we thank you for allowing us to be in your house today. We thank you for all the many wonderful blessings you've given us this week. We thank you once again for allowing us to start the service with, a, with believer's baptism. Lord, what a, what a great thing, that way to start the service. Father, we come before you with many prayer requests on each of our hearts today. We especially lift up Mark McMillan. We continue to lay your hand of, of comfort upon him and his family. Uh, just bless them, uh, watch over him, and take care of them. Father, we especially pray for Brother Brad as he travels back from Arkansas. Just be with them, uh, give them traveling mercies. Father, we also ask that you be with Brother Kyle today as he brings the message. We ask that you would just uh, open each of our hearts and our minds so that you may receive the word that you've laid on Kyle's uh, heart today. And Father, we ask that you just bless this offering and use it to further your kingdom. In your name we pray. Amen. I would invite you to stand once more and turn to hymn 223. Hymn 223, Nothing But the Blood.
reading of the word. Our scripture reading this morning is found in Psalm 34, verses 1 through 3. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. May God bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. <clears throat> morning. What is about the best word you want to hear spoken out loud? Okay, you already, you ruined my punchline, but usually we love to hear our own name spoken, don't we? We hate for people to go, hey, you back there. But there's something so special about hearing our own name. Well, Melody already beat me the punchline, but yes. The most lovely and the sweetest name is Jesus, and that's what I'm singing about today.
anticipation. <laughs> okay. Sorry. There's a name above all others, wonderful to hear, bringing hope and cheer. It's the lovely name of Jesus, evermore the same. What a lovely name, what a lovely name, the name of Jesus, reaching higher far than the brightest star. Kathy for sharing that with us this morning. Now I uh, recently read a story about a Croatian refugee. And this man, he had uh, fled his war-torn country and arrived in Australia some years before. Uh, and since then, since he arrived in Australia, his marriage had broken up. He had lost custody of his children. Not only that, 24 members of his family, including his 84-year-old grandfather and four-month-old niece, had been killed during the most recent conflict in Croatia. And he responded to his circumstances saying this. He said, where is God when it really matters? I'll tell you where. God has gotten fed up with us. And he has put up a sign saying, gone fishing, and left us to live in this mess. Where is God when it really matters? Where is God when life gets tough? 
Where is God in the midst of pain and suffering that we endure in this life? Where is he when you lose your job, when uh, cancer or some illness strikes someone in your family, when someone unexpectedly passes away? Does he see it? Does he care? Perhaps you have asked similar questions at some point in your life. Maybe you're asking some of these questions right now. You're just going through a difficult time, and you've had some doubts in your faith along the way. If so, I want you to know that you're in good company, because doubt is basically a problem that believers deal with. If you look throughout the Old Testament, over and over, Jesus said to his disciples, O oh, you of little faith, and at times, how long will you doubt? They had committed themselves to him, they had believed, but their belief from time to time hit some snags and they had some doubts. Jesus said to them in Matthew 21, 21, if you have faith and doubt not, you will be able to say to this mountain, get up and move. He addresses their doubts. He continually had to remind them not to doubt. Paul writes in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8, he says, I want men everywhere to lift up holy hands, praying and not doubting. James said, if you doubt, you are a divided man, unstable in all his ways. So doubt is a matter that belongs in the life of a believer. That's the place where it fits. I'm not saying that it ought to be there, but if we're honest, we would admit that it is at times, that we face questions, that we face doubts in our faith journey. Doubt is a common response to hard times in life. And this morning we're going to look at an example from Scripture of a man who followed Jesus, who pointed others to Jesus, and yet still faced a moment of doubt in his life when it took an unexpected turn for him. This morning we're going to look at the life of John the Baptist. And I invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 11. We'll be looking at Matthew 11, verses 1 through 15. And as you're turning there, just as a reminder to all of this, mo this morning, uh, John the Baptist, he was uh, Jesus' cousin. Uh, he was the son of Elizabeth, Mary's uh, sister. And uh, he was sent with a purpose. And that purpose was to prepare the way for Jesus' ministry, to point others to him. He pointed others to Jesus by uh, preaching a message of repentance and by uh, then baptizing those who responded to that call to, re to repentance. Um, he is called John the Baptist, but uh, he's actually John the Baptizer. I don't want us to be confused. He was not the first Southern Baptist. He was not the first president of the Southern Baptist Convention. Um, he was John the Baptizer. Uh, and uh, in this passage, we find that after many years of following Jesus, of pointing others to Jesus, we find John has been imprisoned. John, he's probably imprisoned uh, in an area in a fortress called uh, Machaerus. And uh, he's been put there by King Herod. This is not the same King Herod as uh, the one who uh, called for the murder of all the, the infants when Jesus was, uh, when Jesus was born. Uh, but instead, this is a different King Herod in that lineage, uh, in that line, in that family. Um, and uh, he, John has been put in prison, not because he's done anything wrong, not because he's done anything illegal, but John finds himself in prison because he stood for what was right for he stood for God's word. He stood for truth. You see, uh, this King Herod, uh, he uh, chased after his brother's wife. And uh, as a result, divorced his own wife and married his brother's wife. And uh, John the Baptist confronts King Herod about this and says, you should not have your brother's wife. This is wrong. And as a result, King Herod says, I'm a man in authority. I'm going to take care of this problem. John, I'm going to silence you. And he puts him in prison. So now let's pick up in Matthew chapter 11, starting in verse 1, and we'll be able to be witnesses here this morning of this moment of doubt that John the Baptist faced. Matthew chapter 11, starting in verse 1, says, When Jesus had finished instructing his twelve disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in their cities. Now when John heard in prison about the deeds of the Christ, he sent word by his disciples and asked him, Are you the one who is to come? Or shall we look for another? And Jesus answered him, 
Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk. Lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. And the dead are raised up, and the poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. And as they went away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds concerning John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? What then did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Behold, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. Yet the one who is the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets in the law prophesied until John, and if you're willing to accept it, he is Elijah who is to come. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. So the first thing that I see in this passage this morning about doubt uh, is that uh, when we doubt God, when we face those moments, those crises in our life, and we have a moment of doubt, we're really doubting his goodness and his affection and his care for us. When we're doubting God, we're doubting his care, his goodness, and his affection for us. Look back at verses 2 and 3 with me. It says, Now when John heard in prison about the deeds of the Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? So here's John. He's now sitting in prison. He's heard about all these miraculous works that Jesus was doing. However, instead of this news encouraging John, it caused him to doubt whether Jesus really was the promised Messiah. It's likely that John thought that he was being forgotten about while others were being helped. He was thinking, hey, what about me? You know, I, I've, I've followed you, I have served you, I have pointed others to you, and yet here I am in this rotten prison cell. Others are being helped. What about me? When am I going to get out of here? If we're honest, we've probably had similar thoughts to that at one point or another. God, what about me? I read an interview by Matt Chandler here recently. Matt Chandler is the pastor of the Village Church in Dallas, Texas, and uh, he faced a moment of doubt like this uh, when it was discovered that he had brain cancer. And here's what he had to say. He said, so I'm sitting on the couch one day, and so my wife had taken these Christmas cards with everyone's pictures on them, and, and there was a picture of a family that my wife is friends with, and, and, and the wife... And the guy that was in the photo, the, the guy, he uh, has had multiple affairs on his wife and is just unbelievably self-centered and wicked to his wife and rude to his daughters. And I remember looking at that picture and going, really? Really, God? Me? Like, I'm the one with brain cancer? Are you serious? It can be easy to think this way when we're going through a painful time in our life. It can be easy for us to say, God, why me? Why isn't it this other person who is being, who's behaving in some wicked manner, who is uh, doing all these awful things? Why is it me? I've been faithful to you. I've followed you. Why is this happening to me? Why is it happening to my family? You know, what should have been a, a joyous occasion uh, turned into a nightmare for a man named Randy Hoyt. Uh, he and his wife were expecting their seventh child. And uh, he watched helplessly as his wife, Chris, had to be rushed for an emergency C-section operation when she was only five months pregnant. The bleeding was tremendous, and Chris required 30 units of blood. And as the doctors battled to save her life, Randy cried out to God, God, what do you want? I know you can heal her. Why don't you? But God didn't heal her. Chris died, and then 16 days later, their prematurely born daughter, Grace, lost her life as well. Randy was left as the single parent of six children. What about our plans, God, he asked. Who will teach the kids? Who will guide them? Who will love them like their mother, mother would have? Randy soon found out. A program was started which became known as Help Bring Hope to the Hoyt Kids. And over the next six months, hundreds of people worked, sent money, donated meals and supplies, and poured love upon Randy's family. 
Randy received more than 500 letters, emails, and cards from people who said that they were praying for that family. And at the end of the six months, all of their medical bills were taken care of, their mortgage had been paid off, and Randy was able to go back to work. God did not save Randy's wife or his daughter, but God's love was ministered to Randy and to his children in a deeply profound way after Chris's death. The pain of Chris's and Grace's death, of course, it still remained. Yet, when he started to sink in despair, Randy said that he could just imagine the two of them in heaven together, fully alive, healthy, and full of joy. See her as she is now, he felt the Holy Spirit saying to him. She is alive in the presence of Jesus. Reflecting upon his experience, Randy says, I asked God for the life of my wife. I received instead a lesson on the nature of God. God is good. Armed with that knowledge, I have no fear for today or for the future. God will always be enough for any situation. Just as Randy had discovered that God is enough to see him through the dark places of life, he is enough for you and for me as well. The second thing that I see from this passage this morning is that uh, when we doubt God, that oftentimes is because that we are trying to control God. We're trying to tell God what he should have done, what he should do, what his response should have been. Look back with me in verses 4 through 6. This was Jesus' response to John's question. And Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk. Lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. And the dead are raised up, and the poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. We must realize that God cannot be controlled. He's not like having a, a magic genie lamp where we can take it and we can rub it, and then poof, you know, out comes this magical being there to do whatever we want him to do. He's not like that. He's so much bigger and so much better than that. And he is infinitely wiser than we could ever hope to be. And the problem with us trusting God in, in, some try, in trying situations and when, when tragedy strikes our families is that we have incomplete information. We don't see the end result. We don't see how God is working behind the scenes and how he's going to work this for our good and for his glory. We have incomplete information. It reminds me of a uh, time in my life, a story that my mom likes to tell about me. Um, and uh, there was a time when I was somewhere between one and two years old, and she had had some family over to the house. There were some ladies that were there. And uh, I, was, uh, still, I was walking around, and I, I was still in diapers, and, and I would go into the kitchen, and I would get bread. And I would come, and I would take it to these ladies there in the living room. And uh, so I would go, and I would get these pieces of bread, and I would take it to them, and they would think, oh, that's so cute. And they would just, out of politeness, they would take it, and they were starting to eat some of it. And, uh, and finally I got to, I think, my aunt, Lois, and I was going to take her a piece of bread, and she said, uh-uh, I know where that bread has been. And uh, what I was doing, what I apparently liked to do at that age, is I would take things, and I would put it in my diaper. And uh, I was taking those pieces of bread, and putting them in my diaper, and then pulling them out and bringing them to my family, to my relatives. Uh, my Aunt Lois knew that this was the, the case, but uh, the rest of my family did not. Uh, and so incomplete information, the rest of those ladies, they would have responded differently had they known the full story. And oftentimes that's true for us. We would respond differently to God if we really knew the end result. But he doesn't give that to us, does he? Instead, he says, follow me today. I'll lead you one step at a time. Trust me. Follow me. When John was asking Jesus if he was the one who is to come, he was asking if Jesus was really the Messiah. You see, the people of that day, they were expecting a Messiah who would save them from the oppression of the Roman government. And Jesus didn't, just, he just didn't seem concerned about that at all. And so the people, the Jewish people, they misunderstood the mission of the Messiah. Jesus came to save us from an enemy far greater than a corrupt government. He came to save us from the destructive power of sin. And so Jesus' response to John here, he says, 
he adds a new beatitude. If you remember the beatitudes from Matthew chapter 6, here Jesus now in Matthew 11 adds another beatitude. He said, blessed is the one who is not offended by me. In other words, blessed is the one who accepts me for who I am and not for who you want me to be. Sometimes we can try and create an image of God in our mind of just who we want him to be. And our prayer needs to be, God, help us to see you for who you really are and not just for who we want you to be. We cannot control God. We cannot make him to be or to do what we want him to. He is far too powerful, far too wise in order to let us do something like that. Third, when we doubt God, we may forget who he is for a moment, but he does not forget who we are. He never forgets who you are. If you'll look back with me in, verses, uh, in verse 11 here, here's, what, here's how, what Jesus had to say about John the Baptist. He said, Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. So here he is, Jesus is saying, even though John has had this moment of doubt, Jesus doesn't respond harshly. He's not saying, that's it. John's done. I'm done with him. But instead, he reminds the people, here, here is who John is. Among those born of women, there is no one greater than John the Baptist. And not only does he make that statement about him, but did you see where we're included in this verse? Look at the end there of verse 11 and what Jesus had to say about you and me. He says, and yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. He's talking about us. Jesus said that the one who is the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than John the Baptist. He's referring to, uh, when he says that we're greater than John the Baptist, he's referring to the, the benefits that we get to partake in. He's referring to the advantages that we have to being part of the new covenant. We can experience once and for all forgiveness for our sins. We have immediate access to God's presence. We no longer have to uh, depend upon a priest to go behind the, the veil of the Holy of Holies. But now we have direct access to God for ourselves. We don't have to go through anyone else. And not only that, but we have the permanent indwelling of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Fred Craddock, a, uh, he's a professor of theology at Emory University. And he tells of a time that he was on vacation in Tennessee. He and his wife were having dinner at a restaurant when this old man came up to them and began talking with them, asking how they were doing and if they were enjoying their vacation. And when the old man asked Fred what he did for a living, Fred saw this as an opportunity to get rid of this guy. It was, he was really kind of getting annoyed by the whole thing. He was just trying to enjoy a dinner with his wife there on vacation and really didn't want to be bothered. And so he thought, okay, this is my chance to get rid of this guy. And so he told him, I'm a preacher. He thought, for sure, this is going to get rid of this guy. A preacher? Well, that's great. Let me tell you a story about a preacher, uh, this guy said. And the old man sat down at their table, and he started to speak with them. And as he did, Fred's annoyance, it turned to humility. See, the old man explained that uh, when he was born, he was born without knowing who his father was. He was an illegitimate child. And he carried that shame throughout his childhood. He was looked down upon in the community. His family was looked down upon in that community, in that small town. And one day, a new preacher came to the local church in that town. And uh, the old man explained that as a youngster, he had, he had never gone to church. But one Sunday, he decided to go and just check this guy out and, and hear this new pastor preach. And he did, and, and he enjoyed it. It was good. And that illegitimate boy went back again and again and again, in fact, he started attending just about every week. But as he went, his shame also went with him every week. This poor little boy would always arrive late to the service, and he would leave early in order to avoid having to talk to anyone, having to deal with anyone, having to face anybody. But one Sunday, he got so caught up in the sermon that he forgot to leave before the sermon was over. And before he knew it, the service was over and the aisles were filling and he rushed to get past the people and out the door. But as he did, he felt a heavy hand suddenly 
upon his shoulder. And when he turned around, he saw this preacher, a big, tall man looking down at him, asking, What's your name, boy? Whose son are you? The little boy just died inside. The very thing that he was trying to avoid, the very thing he was hoping to escape, was now right there before him. But before he could say anything, the preacher looked at him and said, I know who you are. I know exactly who you are. And I know who your family is. There's a distinct family resemblance. Why? You're a child of God. And in that moment, those words changed this man's life. He turned his life over to Jesus, and his life went a completely different direction. The old man sitting there at Fred Craddock's table said, You know, mister, those words that the preacher shared with me that morning, they changed my life. And with that, he got up and left. And their waitress came over and said to Fred Craddock and his wife, he said, do you know who that was? No, they said. They, we had no idea. It was just some old man that came over to talk to us. And the waitress explained, well, that was Ben Hooper, the two-term governor of Tennessee. Here was a young boy who felt shame growing up, felt his life was hopeless, felt that he was not worth anything. And yet, in a moment... Someone spoke truth into his life. Someone spoke hope into his life. And his life was changed forever. His path was changed forever by the grace of Jesus Christ. He was finally told who he really was. When we doubt, we need to remember who God says that we really are to him. Sometimes when we face doubts, we can suddenly feel overcome with shame. Guilty for having those doubts, those thoughts. When John had those doubts, Jesus did not take that as an opportunity to shame him. Instead, he took it as an opportunity to speak up for John and to remind the people of who John was. And when we doubt, we need to remember who God says we are to him. We are his dearly loved children. So, when we face doubts in our faith, what do we do? What are we to do with those doubts when we face them in our life? Because they're going to come. None of us, none of our families are exempt from facing hard times in our life. And probably most of us at some point or another will face a moment of doubt where we question, God, are you there? Do you care? Are you seeing what I'm going through? Here's what we do. We respond like John did and we take our doubts to the source. We take them to Jesus. That's what John did. He didn't, he didn't go to some other place. He didn't to find the answer. Instead, he sent some of his disciples. He was stuck in prison, so he sent some of his followers, his disciples, to go and get this answer from Jesus himself. Who is he really? So when we face doubts, we take them to God's word, and we allow God to remind us that he does indeed see what we're going through and that he does indeed care for us. We allow him to remind us that he is in control. And that he is still working out his plan and his will for our lives. And that he can use even the worst experience that we go through for his glory and for our good. And we allow him to remind us of who we are in him. We are his. We are his children. And we are loved by our Heavenly Father. Don't allow doubts to turn you away from God. Take your doubts directly to him. And trust that God is good all the time. And even though we may not be able to see how our current circumstances can be worked together for good, we must lean on Him and on our faith in Him to see us through the dark places that we have to walk through in this life. I am thankful. I, we've sang about the name of Jesus, and I am thankful that there is power in the name of Jesus. I'm thankful that there is freedom found in Jesus. And there is hope found in the name of Jesus. And it is my prayer that each one of us in here this morning, that we know that hope. And no matter what you're walking through in your life right now, no matter what you're experiencing, that you will take everything that you're going through, even your doubts, directly to him. And trust him that he's good, that he loves you, that he's faithful.
and that he can and will bring good out of even the worst things that we go through for our good and for his glory. Let's pray together. Father, we come before you this morning and we thank you for the opportunity to open your word. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to uh, find encouragement from the example of John the Baptist that, uh, the Father, that he experienced things very much like we do, that even one who followed Jesus so closely and pointed others to him, that even he experienced a moment of doubt. Father, we pray, Lord, that in our lives as we go through difficult, trying times in our lives, that, Father, that we would be like John the Baptist and we would take our doubts to you. That we would seek you for the answers that we're looking for. Not any other source, but, God, that we would go directly to you and to your word. We thank you that you have not hidden yourself from us, but you have made yourself known that we might know you and walk with you and know that you are a good God who cares for us. Help us to trust you today and every day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. If you're here this morning and uh, maybe you're going through a difficult time in your life, I, we're going to have a hymn of invitation. And maybe you just need to come forward. The altar will be open. You can just come and kneel and pray and uh, just lay that burden, whatever it might be, before the Lord. Or maybe you're here this morning and there's some other decision that you need to make. Maybe you're here and you've realized you have never put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ to be your personal Lord and Savior. And you'd like to make that decision today. You'd like to begin this faith journey with God today. You can come forward and you can make that decision as well. Or maybe you're here and you'd like to make First Baptist your church home. If that's you, then we invite you to come forward as well. Whatever decision you feel the Lord laying upon your heart to make, you come as we sing. Let's stand and sing together. Uh, well, you can have a seat for just a moment. Um, I'm going to ask uh, for uh, Brax to come on up and uh, stand here with me for just a moment. And uh, I tell you, uh, we're so uh, excited for him. He has come forward this morning to make his decision public. Uh, he has uh, he trusted in Christ uh, about a year ago. And uh, he now just wants everybody to know that he's a Christian, that he has uh, put his faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And there's proud little brother there, too. That's great. Uh, and, uh, and so uh, he wants to be obedient to the Lord, make his decision public, and then to follow in believers' baptism. So if you would rejoice with Braxton in his decision, would you let it be known by saying amen? Amen. Yeah, all right. And uh, we're going to have him stand here and have his family come stand with him as well. And uh, after, as we close in prayer here, we're just going to ask you all come forward and uh, shake his hand, give him a hug, say an encouraging word to him, let him know you're excited for him. Uh, but uh, let's, uh, let's close in a word of prayer, and then you come forward and, and you let Braxton know that you're so excited for him. Uh, Mark, would you close us in prayer this morning? Amen. Right, you stand right here, okay?